Welcome everyone to our Sunday evening Sutra and Dharma talk. So tonight will be our last session on the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. I'll be talking about the 10th great vow to universally transfer all merit and also the merit of reading, reciting and upholding these great vows. So before we go into that, I'll invite you to please bring your hands to your heart center and we can all do the sutra opening verse together. Namo fundamental teacher, Shek Kimoni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shek Kimoni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shek Kimoni Buddha. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle and wondrous Dharma. It's difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of kapas. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it. May we understand the true meaning of the Tathagata. Namo flower adornment assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo great practices Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. Namo Amitabha Buddha. Okay, and before we go into the sutra discussion, I just like to make a quick announcement. As most of you probably are aware of, we have currently have this ongoing 40 retreat, seven day near for retreat online and starting today, from Sunday the 17th to the 23rd uh, on a Saturday. So we'll be doing this every month on the third week of the month. And tonight will be our last session on the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. And I'm thinking next Sunday, uh, we may be able to have a Pure Land podcast session uh, as I've also been receiving quite a few uh, comments and questions. Uh, so maybe next Sunday we will have uh, a podcast and um, before we go into maybe the 48 great vows of Amitabha Buddha. So we can discuss that uh, maybe at the end of the Sutra talk. Uh, I intend to talk about the 48 great vows of Amitabha Buddha. And I just like to see uh, what people uh, feel like. Okay, so we'll go into just a quick review of the 10 great vows uh, as usual. And I trust most of you can already maybe memorize them. And I hope all of you, by the time uh, of we finish all the studies, can all finish uh, memorizing uh, these great vows. So first to pay homage to all the Buddhas. Again, all the Buddhas include uh, all the Buddhas from past, present and future, which means all beings, including us. Uh, why we should pay homage uh, to all beings because all beings all have the Buddha nature. So we should all respect all beings. This is regardless of how their current behaviors, actions of speech are like. But in essence, all of us, all beings are the same. We all share the same Buddha nature, uh, the oneness in all beings. And second is to praise the Tathagatas. So this is also, uh, a continuation from the first fast, also to praise the Buddha nature in all beings. So in that way, when we really change our attitude towards all sentient beings, when we know how to respect all beings, this is how we can all live in peace and harmony. And third is to extensively cultivate making offerings. So if we know that we all share the same Buddha nature, then there is really no difference uh, between who we are, uh, despite we may all look different externally. And of course, we want to uh, try our best to help others. And actually here, it's a, an upgrade, an extension of just saying to give things to others, but rather to make offerings because you're really making offerings to all Buddhas, uh, including all future Buddhas. And fourth is to repent of karma obstacles and reform. Uh, this is really uh, the key in practicing Buddhism, like all Dharma gates. 
uh, in essence, the Dharma gates of repentance because we are imperfect human beings. Uh, although the essence of who we are is actually perfect and complete, like our Buddha nature, but because now we are currently asleep, right, aren't awakened yet. So of course, we'll keep committing mistakes and how we can actually get better to purify our body, speech, and mind is really to face our mistakes with the right attitude and to repent, right? not to complain about other people or external situations, but really to repent and reform. And in that way, we can improve each day. And this is what can bring us uh, to be awakened eventually. Right? If you think you're all perfect and complete now, uh, maybe you are already a Buddha, I only at the level of the Buddha, uh, one can be said to be perfect and complete. Uh, one will not make any mistakes uh, with the body, speech, and mind. As we see in this sutra, even Bodhisattva, like Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, like this highest level of enlightened beings, uh, Bodhisattvas, they still keep repenting, uh, thought after thought without ceasing. And what says about ordering on enlightened beings like us? So to rejoice in marriage, this can also help us to overcome uh, jealousy, to reduce our, a lot of afflictions. When we see others uh, cultivate good deeds or the others are better than us, right? instead of being jealous, we should really rejoice in merit of others. And this can also help us to expand our mind, expand our heart. And six, to please turn the Dharma wheel, to invite the Buddha, well, we don't see the Buddhas now on this world, uh, to, or to invite any good Dharma teachers or even including yourself. Uh, if you have the ability or you have uh, a little bit of knowledge, uh, whatever you know, you can also share, uh, for instance, share the near for practice uh, with as many people as possible. Uh, you can just share it simply as a meditation if you feel you don't know much, but at least uh, this practice is so easy so simple, you can just tell people to recite the name of Amitabha Buddha and even just tell them to, you know, kneel for and seek rebirth to the Pure Land uh, at the time of death. A lot of people may not understand or they may not even believe, that's fine. Uh, at least you have already planted a seed in their mind. And uh, in that way, eventually they will be liberated. Uh, this is in according to Amitabha Buddha's vows, right? Maybe not in this life, uh, in this life, they may still not believe or could even slander the Dharma, but definitely in future lifetimes. Right? Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have all kinds of skillful means to eventually bring sentient beings into liberation, into maturity. So what we are doing here, we can just widely plant the seed of Amitabha Buddha in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of means. And in that way, you are also uh, helping the Buddha to turn the Dharma wheel. So infinite merit of doing that. And seventh, to invite the Buddhas to live in the world. Again, we don't know where the Buddhas are, although they are here, but we can't really see them maybe uh, with our physical eyes. Like, even if they're in front of us, we may not be able to know. Uh, there are definitely incarnations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in this world, but we may not be able to uh, identify but anyway, we can also again invite uh, any good Dharma teachers uh, to live in the world, to keep turning the Dharma wheel. So can we see all these vows are really closely connected. Uh, it's very logical. And it comes in an order actually, uh, because you respect all sentient beings, of course you wanna praise all sentient beings. And because of this, of course you wanna uh, make offerings to them and then you want to be better, so you want to repent of karmic obstacles, etc. Right? So it's very logical. And the eighth grave, are, of course, we should constantly learn from the Buddhas. Right? Since we are practicing Buddhism, what does it mean to practice Buddhism? It's to learn from the Buddhas, from the awakened ones. If we don't learn from the Buddhas, what we're going to learn, well, we're just going to be keep trapped in all our illusional thoughts, emotions, and afflictions. And that's why it's really important for us uh, to gather once a week. Once a week is actually not enough. Uh, every day you need to actually remind yourself. Uh, every day when you wake up, think about this 10 great vows. Think about Amitabha Buddha. Uh, think about 
whether your body, speech, and mind, or before you go to bed, I reflect of your actions today about what you have done, your body, speech, and mind, whether they are in accordance with this vow. Of course, we're not perfect. So we're gonna, not gonna be able to actually uh, be 100% in accordance with this vow, but at least the direction of our karma, of our body, speech, and mind uh, should try to fall under this kind of direction. Uh, not the opposite directions. Uh, at least if we can even just follow like 1%, 5%, 10%, like each day, our life will be different. Uh, eventually, if you can follow 100%, then you are a Buddha. Uh, These three vows really help us become completely awakened. Uh, if we practice these great vows now, while we're here on earth, before we go to the pure land, then when we seek rebirth, we'll be on the highest grade of rebirth. Right? This will be really clear uh, after tonight's session and also when we talk about the nine grades of rebirth. And even for bodhisattvas who after seeking rebirth to the pure land, they still need to practice these 10 great vows. Right? All the great practices and vows are not away from all these 10 great vows. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas vows, they are not away from these 10 great vows. Right? That's why it's so important. Right? This is really the key in Mahayana Buddhism. Right? People ask, oh, what do you practice in Mahayana Buddhism apart from the six parameters, uh, the six uh, perfections, right? Like giving, cultivate, uh, forbearance, patience, uh, precepts, meditation, wisdom. Uh, that's like a, a primary school or middle school. And then eventually like the upgrade of that is the 10 great vows. Right? When you are really practicing these 10 great vows, maybe not 100%, I cannot do 100%. I say maybe 5%, 10%, then you are definitely on the Bodhisattva path. Uh, you are a kindergarten Bodhisattva, a primary school Bodhisattva like kindergarten Guan Yin, kindergarten Samadavadra, right? then you are really learning from the Buddhas and also following the path of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And the nice great vow, which we talk about, to constantly accord with all living beings, right? because we want to, not we, right? Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and also we, right? if we are learning from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they want to, well, what's the purpose of doing this? It's also to help all living beings to liberate out of sufferings. And how to do that? They also need to constantly accord with living beings so they can be in harmony with living beings. They can make all living beings happy. So living beings will eventually be wanting to listen to what they're saying, right? If you really hate someone, you're not gonna listen to what this person says, right? If there's someone in your life that makes you feel happy all the time, right? Uh, with all kinds of ways, then you're gonna listen to what they say, regardless of whatever they say. So this is also the skillful means uh, of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and really the compassion, uh, infinite compassion. So why, like Guan Yin, uh, in the universal gate of Bodhisattva Guan Yin, I found the Lotus Sutra. Why Guan Yin promised to help all sentient beings if when they are in disasters or when they encounter danger or when they want to uh, have a good children, uh, to pray to her, to call on her name, then she will really fulfill their wish. So why is that? Again, to constantly accord with all living beings. Right? That's why Guan Yin it has so much influence all over the world. Like even for non-Buddhists, they will all know about Bodhisattva Guan Yin because Guan Yin really constantly accord with all living beings that really try to fulfill the wishes and desires of living beings. I don't mean like the evil desire, but like the good desire at least, like good wish. They want to have a, a smart kid, uh, you know, for those who are pregnant or, or in expecting for a baby or you currently, you cannot have a baby, but you want to have a baby, really go and pray for Guan Yin. Uh, it really works uh, in the China in Putuo Mountain. Uh, every year people go and pray for Guan Yin uh, to have uh, good children. And Guan Yin will really fulfill their wish if they're very sincere. And then the next year they'll come back again to repay their gratitude. 
Right? So it says clearly in the sutra, uh, this is also a trick I, I tell my friends, if they're pregnant and they want to have also a smooth uh, delivery of the baby and also they want to have smart uh, baby, that's what you need to do, right? To call on the name of Guan Yin. And tonight, we're gonna talk about to universally transfer all marriage. This is really like the conclusion uh, of all the previous vows, right? Why it's a conclusion? Because how we can actually transfer merit, uh, where the merit actually comes from. It comes from all the previous nine great vows. Uh, you need to practice all of this. You cultivate all these good deeds, and then you generate merit, and you can universally transfer all merit. And what does it really mean? So we first look at the text from the sutra. Moreover, good men, now good men again refers to Sudana, which we already talked about before, how uh, this is the last chapter of the great Mahayana Sutra, of Avatansanka Sutra, also known as the Flower Adornment Sutra, and where the child Sudana, uh, also at a Bodhisattva, uh, he visited 53 good teachers, good advisors, and eventually uh, he came to uh, Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, and Samadabhadra reveals to him this 10 great vows. This is what can help him to realize the final Buddhahood, like perfect uh, and complete Anuttaya Sanya Sambodhi. So good men referring to Sudana. Moreover, good men, to universally transfer all merit is explained like this. All the merit from first paying homage until constantly accord, I universally transfer to all living beings in the entire Dharma realm and the realm of empty space. May all living beings always obtain peace and happiness free from all sickness and suffering. For those who want to commit evil, this cannot be done. For all the good deeds cultivated, may they quickly be accomplished. Closing all the evil gates reveals the right path of humans, heavenly beings, and nirvana. If all living beings, because of their accumulation of evil karma, feel all the extremely heavy bitter fruits, I'll take on all the suffering on behalf of them so that all beings can be liberated and achieve the supreme body. The Bodhisattva cultivates transference as such. Even when the realm of empty space is exhausted, the realms of living beings are exhausted, the karma of living beings is exhausted, and the afflictions of living beings are exhausted, such transference as mine will be endless. It continues in thought after thought without ceasing. The karma of my body, speech, and mind will never be wary of these deeds. Okay, so before we go into uh, looking at the details of this text, I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, the purpose of studying Buddhism, which we already talked about before. But it's really important to emphasize this and then so we see how all these great vows really make sense. Uh, we must not forget uh, why we are practicing Nianfo, why we seek rebirth to the Pure Land, why we are practicing the Buddha Dharma. Uh, what is the purpose? It's not only just to cultivate good deeds, to be a good person uh, in life. Of course, like, this is like goes without saying, like basic. But the ultimate purpose is to realize Buddhahood and why do we need to realize Buddhahood? And the purpose of realizing Buddhahood is for what? At first, of course, it can already help us liberate out of all sufferings ourselves. Right? If you can already help yourself to liberate sufferings, you are called an arhat. Right? Arhat is all about self-liberation. As an arhat, you are no longer be subject to any sufferings. But this is not the full Buddhahood we are talking about in Mahayana Buddhism. But right? this is maybe in Theravada Buddhism, they call an aha as a Buddha already. There's already nothing to learn. But in Mahayana Buddhism, this is just like the beginning. And when you liberate out of sufferings, what are you going to do next? You still 
need to help all sentient beings. And why we need to help all sentient beings? Because all sentient beings also, I, we are actually the same. I share the same Buddha nature. We all come from this one source, one essence, and oneness. So this is ultimately the purpose of why we are practicing the Buddha Dharma. It's actually to help all sentient beings to liberate out of all sufferings. And through that, you will, of course, be liberated already. Right? That's why bodhisattvas, they keep vowing to help all sentient beings to liberate out of sufferings. Of course, not all sentient beings have been liberated yet, as we see. But because bodhisattvas have this kind of mindset, have this kind of vows and great practices, they themselves already realize Buddhahood. So it's really through helping others, we also awaken uh, the Buddhahood, realize the Buddhahood within ourselves. So this is the ultimate purpose of studying Buddhism. So that's why all these great vows are really to help us uh, how to best, better treat others, uh, treat all beings, to use by uh, the great vows we talk about to constantly accord with living beings, a nice great vow. But the Sabbaths will always use the compassionate water right, to water all sentient beings. So we cannot actually be away from sentient beings. Right? Sometimes people, they have this misunderstanding on Buddhism or think it's uh, so passive, right? I don't know where they get that from. Maybe they only heard uh, some teachings from a uh, certain teachers uh, that they have this idea that Buddhism is really passive. Uh, it's a really uh, away from life, uh, from people. It's not, uh, definitely not. The bodhisattva path. You cannot avoid living beings. You cannot avoid sentient beings because your purpose is actually to help all sentient beings. And how can you be uh, avoided from all sentient beings and how can you help anybody? Uh, you can't even help yourself. So we must try not to be in duality with others, not to be in conflict with others. All our afflictions in our life uh, we generate afflictions in our life. Most of the time, it's because we are in duality with others. Right? Because of our attachment, our separation, and also we can co be constantly in conflict or in arguments with others. I remember all these great vows did not tell us how to fix others or change others or you know, to complain about the world. But rather, all these 10 great vows are really about uh, how to be better to others, how to respect others, to praise others, and how to actually repent of our own mistakes. In that way, if you know how to direct your mind, your thoughts in that way, it can really greatly help you reduce all afflictions uh, gradually. Eventually, for those who can fully embody all these 10 great vows and practices, you will not have any enemy in this world. Uh, you are definitely free from all enemy, free from all complaint, right? because you truly see the essence of all living beings. Right? You see from the lens of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the, the views of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They really truly treat all beings equally because they know that all beings have the same Buddha nature. And they will all try to adopt all kinds of skillful means uh, to help all beings. They, there's actually no, no more separation between you and me and others, right? like the Diamond Sutra says, there's no self, no sentient beings, no others already, oneness. Right? That's the kind of a reality, the kind of a dimension they live in. Uh, in Chinese term, like, yi zhen fa jie, like this is called a real Dharma realm. Right? It's like really the oneness, real Dharma realm they are living in. And this is the kind of a mindset eventually we also want to achieve. And now we just have so much separation and so much we like to be in duality uh, with the world, with others. And so much we like to go into arguments and uh, conflicts with others. So of course, this is normal because we are really ordinary beings with heavy karma obstacles, right? But all these 10 great vows really give us the map, the direction of how we can skillfully direct our thoughts, direct our mind. And this is really like the light we should follow. Okay, now come back to this 10th vow, the last concluding vow, 
the chance for all marriage. So we talk about this a lot. After our Nianfo session, we always transfer marriage. Right? This is like a common Buddhist term. And a lot of people may not truly understand what it actually means to transfer marriage. So first of all, what does it mean right, to transfer? So when we cultivate good deeds, it generates merit. Right? The law of karma, you cultivate good, right? it generates good merit. Right? Evil, evil, no, no merit, right? negative merit. Uh, although we cannot see the merit, right? it's actually formless, but it actually exists. Once you have this good deeds, it will generate merit. And then you can use this merit to transfer or direct to the fruit or the result you want. So it's a bit like when you, you know, make money and you put a lot of effort to make money and then to buy goods to exchange for goods, a little bit like that. But the difference is that, you know, when we use money uh, to buy something and the money gets less and then we cannot buy more, right? So sometimes people think, if I transfer my marriage to this person, can I still transfer marriage to that person? Yes, you can. Uh, this is what is so incredible and inconceivable of marriage transfer is that the more you transfer and the wider audience you transfer the marriage to, the bigger the marriage you have. Uh, this is a bit different from maybe when we use money to buy uh, something, but actually it's also a little bit like that. It's like an investment. Right? The more Sometimes money we spend, sometimes uh, may, we make offerings. If we make offerings to the right place, then we can also have more money back. It's a bit like that. So actually with the marriage, uh, the more you transfer, the more people you transfer, you will have more merit. And uh, why is that? Because merit is formless. How big the merit depends on how big your heart, your mind is. I uh, remember, what does it mean to realize Buddhahood? Uh, it's really to have this boundless mind, the boundless heart. Our Buddha nature is boundless and measureless, without limit, right? Oneness. So all these 10 great vows, and particularly up to this one, it's all really telling us how to keep expanding our mind like the end of the Dharma ran and the empty space, which the Dharma ran and the empty space actually has no end. Like infinite, limitless. Our Buddha nature is infinite light and life, right? It's boundless. So if we can keep expanding our mind, expanding our heart, then the merit you generate right, will be much, much bigger. And how to have infinite merit? Right? When you have this boundless mind, this boundless heart, that you truly see the oneness in all things and all beings. Right? This is what it means to realize Buddhahood, right? to realize Buddha nature, right? to be in one with all things. And this is not just mere saying, I mean, not mere words. Uh, sometimes I, in the spiritual community, it's very a hip thing to say, oh, you know, I am one, one with all. Uh, blah, 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 right? We can all say that. Uh, I can say that all the time. But whether we can truly embody that, like this is not easy to do because of our unenlightened mind of separation and attachment, like this common obstacle. But through practicing these vows, it can really help us greatly expand our mind, greatly expand our heart. And eventually, after we go to the Pure Land, Maybe it's just too difficult for us to realize one is here. We need to actually first go to Amitabha Buddha's pure land with our karma, and there we can quickly realize Buddhahood. Again, due to uh, the short lifespan we have here, not easy to practice, and also the environment here, not really supportive uh, to our practice. So we actually need to go there to learn from the best teachers that are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and to realize Buddhahood there. So if we want to have infinite marriage, I trust all of us, we want to have infinite marriage, right? We want to have the best, more marriage, as the more the merrier, right? So how to do that? To transfer the marriage to all beings in the entire Dharma realm. Like all these Mahayana Sutras, we see all these Bodhisattvas and Buddhas great vows. After this, we're gonna also learn about Amitabha Buddha's 48 great vows. And we see it's actually the same, right? what they think of every thought after thought 
It's about all sentient beings, all living beings. They will not just think about, oh, you know, my parents, my relatives, my son, my daughter. Uh, no, that, that's what we maybe think about all, all the time. It's just our maybe little family, uh, at most uh, just some friends and family. That's all. Uh, that's all our sort of a narrow circle of thinking. Whereas when the Buddhas and Bodhisattva think, it's always like, can we see all the language in this sutra, also in all these Mahayana sutras, always about all the living beings in the 10 directions, three periods of time, all the living beings in the entire Dharma realm. That's how big of the heart they have, like really boundless heart, boundless mind. And the Siddhagava Fundamental Vow Sutra, which I also, I think, wrote a post about it, right? It was Qingming Festival in China uh, just not too long ago. In this festival, we uh, honor our ancestors. And uh, for Buddhists, usually we will recite the Siddhagapa Fundamental Vow Sutra, and then we transfer marriage to, to them. And also, uh, if you want to have more marriage to transfer to all beings in the entire Dharma realm, it states clearly in the Siddhagapa Sutra that uh, for those who transfer marriage to for instance, your parents, your relatives, then you will also have a good marriage for like three lifetimes. But if you can transfer marriage to all beings in the entire Dharma realm, then you can enjoy like infinite marriage for infinite lifetimes. Well, why? <laughs> because the essence of our Buddha nature, again, it's boundless. If you really have this big heart and sincerely, genuinely, I wish, for all beings in the entire Dharma realm, like what Bodhisattva Samadabhadra says here, right? I universally transfer to all living beings in the entire Dharma realm and the realm of empty space. May all living beings always obtain peace and happiness, free from all sickness and sufferings. Right? This is Bodhisattva's great vow. If we really have this sincere wish and desire for all living beings to obtain peace and happiness, to be free from all sickness and sufferings, of course, you will have infinite marriage. If you have this great, great heart, then you, you are very resonate uh, with the heart of all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and also with your own Buddha nature. Uh, our own Buddha nature is, in essence, perfect and complete. The marriage is actually not generated from the outside. The marriage is already full and complete in our Buddha nature. Uh, if we can realize this true essence of who we are, we already have full and complete and perfect merit, infinite merit. So if we were to transfer merit, right, instead of just transfer merit to our maybe parents, family, relatives, friends, we may as well just transfer merit to all beings in the entire Dharma realm. Right, if we were to generate bodhicitta, we may as well just generate the greatest and surpass bodhicitta. If you were to make money, why don't you just make more money? It's a bit like that. Hey, marriage is much better than money because you cannot bring money with you at the time of death. But you, what you can bring with you is your karma, your marriage uh, to the pure land. Or oh, in the cycle of reincarnation, currently now, our living situation, like everything we enjoy here, it's also dependent on our marriage that we generated from the past up until now. Right? So if you complain about your current situation and you really need to give rise to the heart of repentance, and maybe you have not generated enough merit in the past, and maybe you were being too selfish, like you did not want to give to others. Or, right? But how, if you want to change your life, change your destiny now, really transfer the merit to all the entire Dharma realms, to all beings, really genuinely wish all the best for all beings. So we may not have the capacity actually to, you know, help all beings light the bodhisattvas, but at least we can first generate this kind of a heart, this kind of mindset. If you have this kind of mindset, you are already generating bodhicitta. And sincerely, this is called unsurpassed bodhicitta. Uh, bodhi, uh, the typo here, apologize. So bodhi means awakened. Uh, chitta means mind, heart. So the purpose of practicing Buddhism it's actually to awaken the heart and mind. It's not about rituals. If you kneel for, if you pay homage to the Buddhas, like you bow at the Buddha statue every day, you uh, recite sutras, mantras, dharanis, but you still keep this narrow-minded mindset. 
Uh, you still keep in constant duality and conflict with all beings. Then you're not awakened and you're not actually progressing on the path of awakening. And then you may complain, you know, oh, why this mantra sutras doesn't work? I, why, when I kneel for, I keep suffering more, right? And because you don't know uh, the purpose of practicing this it's actually to awaken our mind, to awaken the heart. And we need to be clear how to direct our mind when we do this Dharma practice as well. So this is very important. And the sutra really explains this clearly. And we really don't just read the words uh, on the surface, but we need to actually to practice it in order for it to work in our life then you will not complain that the Buddha Dharma doesn't work. A Buddha's teaching really is the truth. If it doesn't work in your life, if you're practicing the Dharma and you're not feeling more joy and happiness and bliss, then you are not really understanding the essence of the Dharma and how to adopt and skillfully apply it in your life. Okay, eventually it's really about directing our mind, directing our heart to expand our mind, to expand our heart and wish for the best. I genuinely wish for the best and trying our best to help all sentient beings. So here, Bodhisattva Samadabhadra says, I genuinely may all living beings always obtain peace and happiness free from all sickness and suffering. Uh, this we should just uh, really every day when we wake up, I think about this or throughout the day, I think about this really or oh, after you kneel for I universally transfer to all living beings in the entire Dharma realm and the realm of empty space. May all living beings always obtain peace and happiness free from all sickness and suffering. Of course, not all living beings have obtained peace and happiness, have free from sickness and suffering. But for you to think like this, you yourself already free from suffering. Right? For you to think like this, you already yourself obtain peace and happiness. Does that make sense? And that's how bodhisattva become awakened because they think like this instead of thinking about you know all those rubbish and nonsense that uh, negative thoughts that just do not actually do any good uh, to our mental health and to the path of awakening. Uh, so we need to really drop our complaint and really try to think like what the bodhisattva think. This is called uh, learning from the Buddhas and bodhisattvas. So for those who want to commit evil, this cannot be done. So here is saying that for those who want to commit evil because we have evil thoughts, like we're not uh, completely enlightened yet, like only at the level of our heart, one can distinguish uh, all these evil thoughts. So we're not there, which means that we're gonna generate evil thoughts. But when we generate evil thoughts, here is saying that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they will try to help us like to not commit it. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have evil thoughts every day on a daily basis. I, but if we keep expanding our mind and also keep practicing like following these great vows, uh, eventually you will not want to commit them. Like what's the difference be before was that maybe before we learn about the Buddha Dharma, we generate evil thought and then we go and commit an evil act. But as we keep walking on the path of awakening, as we keep learning all these practices and vows, next time we have this evil thought arise, or we are aware, and then we may not actually have the motivation to commit the act right? because we are aware of the karmic consequences we believe deeply or in the law of karma. And also because we are learning right, from uh, these practices and vows, it's already taken an effect on you. You have been practicing. And this really shows uh, your improvement uh, on, on the path. For all the good deeds cultivated, may they quickly be accomplished. Closing all the evil gates, review the right path of humans, heavenly beings, and nirvana. So Bodhisattva vows, I, all the Bodhisattva all have this, I should really try to close all the evil gates. What are the evil gates? Like the three evil ramps. Hungry ghost, animal, hell rams. We do not want to go there. Right? Already the human realm, we see already too much suffering here. What says about those evil realms? And review the right path of humans, heavenly beings, and nirvana. Why? Why humans, heavenly beings, and nirvana? Now, this is also 
Buddhism Bodhisattva skillful means, right? Because if you tell them, oh, you know, go to the pure land to realize Buddhahood, to realize enlightenment, a lot of people, they don't believe. Karmic maturity is not there yet right? in this lifetime. I just, it doesn't matter how many people may be on earth, right? how many Buddhist Bodhisattva come back to tell them about Amitabha Buddha and the pure land and in all kinds of ways. There will always be people that just don't believe. Well, not only they don't believe, they may just keep slandering the Dharma, you know, saying all this nonsense, like just because the calm and maturity, it's not the time for them yet. Maybe after, I don't know, countless eons later, they will believe, right? So that's why Shikimoni Buddha, when he comes to earth to teach, he did not first come out of enlightenment and say, oh, you know, near for and go to Amitabha Buddha's pure land. He did not say that, right? Because he clearly knows and sees the roots of the living beings here, right? He first teach about the four noble truths, noble eightfold paths, the 10 good deeds. You know, if you practice all the five precepts, if you practice the five precepts, you can come back to the human realm. You can reincarnate as a human. Right? This is much better than being an animal or a ghost or fall into the hell realm. Or if you practice the 10 good deeds, you can ascend to heaven realm. Or if you practice the 10 good deeds and if you have good meditation, that you can ascend to a higher level of heavens. So Shikimoni Buddha also talk about that. And this is again, much better than falling into the evil path. For those with good maturity, like good roots, merit and virtue, then talk about Buddhahood, enlightenment, like Nirvana, all this. And I'm talking about the Pure Land Dharma because I, I'm here first to connect with the people who are already ready in this lifetime, right? There are already other a very good teachers talk about other things about the Buddha Dharma, like other paths that may not actually help them to liberate out of samsara in one lifetime. I'm only here. Uh, I mean, at this moment, that's what I want to do is really to help all the beings who are ready in this life to exit the cycle of samsara. Right? So although I can talk about other things, uh, in the Buddha Dharma, but I want to specifically focus on the Pure Land Dharma because this is the, the only Dharma gate. Out of all these Dharma, Dharma gates can help all the beings in this world to exit the cycle of samsara. And for those people who actually want to exit the cycle of samsara, uh, the percentage is actually not a lot in this world, uh, very little actually. But those with the uh, good roots and maturity, calm and maturity, that's all of you here listening to the Sutra talk, uh, definitely, you know. So congratulations, I just like, we're gonna definitely realize Buddhahood once we go to the Pure Land. Right? It's really the luckiest and most fortunate thing for all of us to encounter the Pure Land Dharma in this life, to really want to exit the cycle of samsara and to realize Buddhahood. Uh, this is not a coincidence for people to have this kind of thought, this kind of mind. If you generate this kind of mind, this kind of thought, even like for once, it means that you already have cultivated a lot of good merit and virtue and blessings in your past lives. It's not a coincidence. So I, I will not ever get angry if people say, oh, I don't believe in what you say. You know, this is like BS, there's no pure land. I, you know, because it's so clear, they just have not cultivated enough karma in this life or in past lives. So it doesn't matter what I said, they will not believe. This is just so normal, so common. So there's no need to uh, get angry or to even be bothered uh, by sayings or comments like that. And this is also the same for anyone who wants to share the Pure Land Dharma. You know that only those whose karma maturity uh, is mature in this lifetime, they will believe and they will actually generate uh, the vow to go to the Pure Land. And I'm saying this, this is really rare. Right? For those who want to vow to seek rebirth to the Pure Land, it's really rare and really precious. Even for some great Dharma teachers, like what some Chan masters, you know, some of them, they also don't believe and they don't vow to go to the Pure Land. And what is most likely to be the consequences uh, to again keep trapped in the cycle of reincarnation. Uh, this is really a pity. Doesn't matter whether you are like the most famous 
Chen Master, if you can't exit the cycle of reincarnation in this lifetime, then what's the use of your practice really? Uh, it, at most, it generated some kind of merit for you in the next life, but you don't even know where you are going to be in the next life, right? A lot of risks, a lot of dangers to keep staying in the cycle of samsara. Uh, we must be aware of that right, for pure land practitioners. Okay, so what is Sava Samadabhadra keeps saying, if all living beings, because of the accumulation of evil karma, feel all the extremely heavy, bitter fruits, I'll take on all the suffering on behalf of them so that all beings can be liberated and achieve the supreme body. Right? This is really, to us, a bit unimaginable, right? not thinkable. How can a person want to take on this, all the suffering on all beings? Like we cannot even take on the suffering, even on ourselves. Like when parts of our body maybe feel sick, or feel, feel ill, like already we feel already too much suffering. And we cannot even take on the suffering maybe on behalf of our parents, on behalf of our wife and husbands, right? Of course we can't uh, because we are just ordinary beings. We actually don't have the ability to take on the sufferings on others. But if we have, like say, if we are like Bodhisattva Buddhas with great spiritual power, if we have the ability to really take on the suffering on behalf of others, will we actually be willing to do that? Maybe not. We will run really fast, right? <laughs> so it's not easy to really generate this infinite compassion the compassion of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have on us is really inconceivable, uh, ineffable, so that all beings can be liberated and achieve the Supreme Body. And actually, how do Bodhisattvas and Buddhas take on sufferings on us by keep coming back to the cycle of samsara? And why do they need to do that? They can totally just keep being in the Pure Land for infinite lifetimes and enjoy just infinite bliss there. Why do they bother to really come back to a world like this, really a world filled with sufferings, a world of five turbidities in the sutra, where sentient beings here in the world really is stubborn and really, really difficult uh, to actually believe in the Dharma and to be actually willing to practice the Dharma. So they really keep coming back to experience lives here and also to take on the sufferings of all living beings so that they can help all beings to be liberated and achieve the supreme body. A really infinite compassion, inconceivable compassion. So the body somewhat cultivates transference as such, even when the realm of empty space is exhausted, the realms of living beings are exhausted, blah, blah, blah. Right? This is the same thing at the end of each vow, such transference as mine will be endless. It continues in thought after thought without ceasing. The karma of my body, speech, and mind will never be wary of these deeds. A really incredible. This is what's called inconceivable state of liberation. The full title of the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra is called the entering into the inconceivable state of liberation of the practices in the house of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. And this is really inconceivable state of liberation right, for anyone who have this kind of mindset right, to have this genuine wish and desire uh, to wish all living beings to obtain peace and happiness, free from all sickness and suffering. And really, we should all really try to think like that, to keep expanding our mind, right, even to someone you really dislike or right, you hate every day <laughs> next time if you see this person think oh i wish him to also obtain happiness and peace and now you can think about that think about someone maybe you recently really dislike or maybe had an argument with right? may he or she also obtain peace and happiness free from all sickness and suffering and when you think like that immediately it shifts your thought your mindset and immediately you yourself actually obtain peace and happiness when we generate a negative thought, we think ill of others. Other people may not feel anything, and maybe they're so far away, they don't feel. But you yourself, actually, you feel suffering in your mind, in your heart, right? That's why we should keep our mind, be really positive, infinite light and life, 
at the essence of who we all are. Okay, and this is a constant attitude, constant practice, moment after moment, thought after thought. And that's what enlightened beings are like for their mind. Each moment is all about this. I all this ten great vows, all about wanting the best for all beings, like how to help all beings to be free from all sufferings. It's not like they don't have any thought, but they know clearly how to direct their thoughts and how to feed their thoughts with like infinite light and positivity. Like, there's no enemies in the eyes of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Okay, so after the Ten Great Vows, then there is this long paragraphs, really long actually, that talk about the merit of this vows. Like why we are studying this, like what kind of merit we can actually generate from learning these vows and practicing these vows. So here Bodhisattva Samadabhaja tells us, Good men, these are the ten great vows of the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Like Mahasattva means great Bodhisattvas. Not just like us, maybe kindergarten Bodhisattva, if you just generate Bodhicitta, but like these are really the great vows of the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, all of which are complete. If Bodhisattvas follow these great vows, then they will be able to mature all sentient beings. They will be able to follow Anuttaya Sanya Sambodhi, and fulfill the ocean of practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. So what does it mean? So if Bodhisattvas can follow these great vows, then they will have the ability to mature all sentient beings. What does it mean to mature all sentient beings? It means that to bring sentient beings, to help them to be awakened and to liberate them out of all sufferings, to bring them outside of the cycle of reincarnation, to realize Buddhahood. They will be able to follow Anuttaya Sanya Sambodhi, which means ultimate enlightenment, like full Buddhahood, and fulfill the ocean of practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. What's the ocean of practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra? The 10 great vows we talk about. But what are these 10 great vows for? Remember, it's for realizing Buddhahood. Right? So the vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra is about realizing Buddhahood. So one will definitely realize Buddhahood if one follow these 10 great vows. Okay, that's what this is saying. Not only that, one can also help all sentient beings to liberate out of sufferings. So therefore, good men, you should understand the meaning as such. If a good man or good woman fill up all the worlds with the supremely wonderful seven jewels, the amount of this world being as much as the fine most of dust in measureless, boundless, ineffably, ineffable Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions. Also, with all the supreme peace and happiness known to gods and humans, and give all of them to all living beings in all worlds, and make offerings to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in all worlds, continuously doing so without ceasing for kapas as many as fine most of dust of those Buddha lands. Okay, it's a long sentence here, but what this is saying is that it's a, like an example. Right? If a good man, good woman can fill out all the worlds with all the supremely wonderful treasures, right? really everywhere, every corner in the entire Dharma realm. And then also, not only that, right? with all this treasure, also with all the supreme peace and happiness known to heavenly beings and humans, and give all of this to all beings, right? make offerings of all of this to all beings in all worlds and to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in all worlds. And not only that, continuously doing so without ceasing for like infinite car pass. The total of all the merit acquired from these deeds, like all this we just talked about, when compared to all the merit of a person who hears these kinds of vows passing by his ears just for once. That's all of you here, right? You have already heard these kinds of vows already passing by your ears, maybe more than once, if, as we already up to the 10 sessions. So if you hear this, like 10 great vows, first to pay homage to all Buddha, second to praise the Tathagatas, third to extensive because you're making offerings. If you hear this 10 great vows, just for once, like ordinary compared to this, that's not equal to one part in a hundred, one part in a thousand, or even one part in an Upanishad. So this is saying that, the merit of hearing these great vows are just so great. 
like all those good deeds that we talk about, like the merit generated from those good deeds, cannot even compare to someone who hear the spouse just for once. Can you imagine? At one part in the Upanishad, Upanishad is also like a measurement uh, talking about the finest, uh, the smallest uh, unit. Okay, so it cannot even be compared. Like, oh, we already think, oh, if someone make offering with all these treasures, all this peace and happiness to all these beings, the marriage should already be infinite, we think. Right? Already, already too much. But when compared to the marriage of someone who hears this vows, even passing by his ears for once, it cannot even be compared. Why? Why it cannot even be compared? Because the 10 great vows can help someone to realize Buddhahood. Uh, if a person realizes Buddhahood, and maybe not in this lifetime, uh, but at least the seed has already been planted for someone just who hears this just for once, eventually this person will realize Buddhahood. If a person can realize Buddhahood, then he can save all infinite beings to also realize Buddhahood. Uh, that's why uh, this marriage is infinite, times infinite. It cannot even be compared. Or if someone with the heart of deep faith reads, recites, and uphold these great vows, even writes out one four-line verse, he can quickly eradicate the karma of the five uninterrupted offenses. All the world's physical and mental illnesses, various kinds of suffering and afflictions, up to and including evil karma equal to the five modes of dust in the Buddha lands will all be eliminated. And this is incredible, right? To eliminate, eradicate the karma of the five unintermittent offenses. Like the five unintermittent offenses are like the gravest offenses that one could ever commit, such as uh, make a Buddha bleed, right? to kill an arhat, uh, to split a harmonious sangha, uh, etc. Uh, to kill one's parents. Uh, these are really, really serious. Uh, if you commit any of this, you're going to definitely fall into the unintermittent hell the worst hell round, where the punishment there is uninterrupted. That's why it's called uninterrupted offenses or unintermittent. You will not even get a rest, a break. Uh, your suffering there will be continuous for infinite kappas. So how can we actually eradicate karma like that? Here it says clearly, with the heart of deep faith, first of all, you need to believe it, deep faith. I truly believe in this. You need to read, recite, and uphold. Uh, this is important. Or even write out one full line verse. I uh, just write out uh, like a complete sentence, a complete meaning. I found this sutra. Uh, for instance, after you're hearing this, and maybe on your Facebook status or whatever Twitter, you can update. I uh, first to pay homage to all the Buddhas like that. So if you can do this, then you can quickly eradicate even the worst unimaginable karma. Not only that, all the world's physical and mental illnesses, very kinds of sufferings and afflictions, up to and including evil karma equal to the five modes of dust, uh, infinite uh, in the Buddha lands, will all be eliminated. So if you want to have good karma, you want to have good health, mental and physical, you want to be free from sufferings, then do this. Right, with the heart of deep faith, reach, recite, uphold these great vows, even write out one four line verse, then you can fulfill that. Uh, why? Uh, because your mind, uh, if you truly believe in this and you practice this, uh, your mind will be so greatly expanded. And you, won't, you will definitely be free from all obstacles in life. And you have no enemies already in your life. Uh, a lot of this a mental illness, physical illness, and also arise by uh, physical illness, a lot of them associated with our mental illnesses. Uh, a mental illnesses arise from our negative thoughts. Uh, that's why it's called mental illness, uh, sick in the mind. So when we can practice this, it can actually uh, correct our mind, our thoughts. And uh, when your mind is filled with infinite light, then definitely you are free from all sufferings and afflictions. All the demonic armies, yakshas, rakshasas, kumbundas, <laughs> apologize if my pronunciation is not perfect, uh, pishashas, 
Brutus, and so forth, all evil ghosts and spirits that drink blood and devour flesh will all stay far away from this person, or they will generate a heart for protection to be near him. So for someone who, you know, have deep faith in this reads, recites, or practice, or even, you know, writing out the sutra, all these demonic armies, evil ghosts and spirits, they will stay far away from you. They will not come to bother you. And then some people may be like, oh, are these like ghosts or spirits really exist? They, yes, they do. They do exist. And I have also recently received a message from someone telling me that like, she's been attacking by ghost in the evening and how to, you know, solve that. And I also experienced this before. I even when uh, on the early day when I first entered into Buddhism, Right, because I also had heavy harm, harm obstacles, right? So I had also been attacked by evil ghosts and spirits right, in the evenings, sometimes before, right, before when I was practicing external practices, not, not the right practices. And all this could be uh, beings I had in, intentionally or unintentionally hurt in the past. And then when they know about maybe me practicing the Buddha Dharma and wanting to exit the cycle of samsara to liberate, of course, maybe they don't want me to liberate. So they really come to attack me in the evening. So I don't talk about these things too much, um, but sometimes I do share when the situation uh, is correct, I feel. But I'm telling you, ever since I studied this gray vows, I have never ever had any nightmare after that. I had never been attacked or coming closer by any of these ghosts and spirits. Like, it has definitely completely changed, I feel. Like, or they will generate a harmful protection to be near him. If these beings come close to you, well, if they know you are practicing this great vows, you are actually studying the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, you will have Dharma protectors. Like, if you are really have this sincere faith like, in practicing this, the Dharma protectors will only allow these beings to be near you if they also generate a heart to want to protect you, okay? So I'm telling that person, like he said, he's been really attacking by this evil spirit like, for quite some time and how to get rid of that. Like, during this, if you recite the name of Guan Yin, Guan Yin also a vow to uh, help us to keep away from evil. So, for a few occasions already, uh, because I recite the name of Guan Yin, so I was free from that incident. But if you really want to not ever see these spirits and evil ghosts again, I, sometimes it's not good to be curious. Uh, there are also uh, really dark energy, dark beings that you actually don't want to come in closer in contact with. Right? And how to, if you want them to really stay far away from you and never come to bother you, then you do this, right? It says clearly here. So I tell him also, uh, or I think it's a her, like this woman to also come uh, to listen to the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadhavadra and to practice it, right? It really works. The Buddha Dharma is real, right? All these words in the sutras, they're not lying. This is really works. If you're really doing what the Buddha, what the Bodhisattva is telling us to do. Okay, therefore, if someone recites these vows, he can move freely in the world without obstacles, like the moon coming out from the clouds. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will praise him. All the humans and gods should all honor and respect him, and all living beings should make offerings to him. So if someone can recite this, so not only read, you actually need to memorize these vows. Right? You need to memorize that right? first to pay homage to all the Buddhas, second to praise the Tathagatas. Uh, you need to memorize this. So I hope all of you can memorize this by now. Then you can move freely in the world without obstacles. Why? Because your heart really greatly expanded so much. You will not see any enemies. It's nothing that actually really bothers you. If you can see the Buddha nature, like the oneness in all things and all beings, and you really have uh, this sincere desire, uh, the wish to help all living beings to liberate out of sufferings, then yourself will also be liberated out of sufferings. And you can definitely move freely in the world without obstacles. 
It's not like obstacles don't, don't exist. We may think something as obstacles, but in the eyes of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, like beings with really big heart, it's not a big deal. Like it's only when we have narrow-minded heart and we think, oh, you know, this is a problem, that's a problem, or he or she really bothers me, etc. Like, but for someone with such a big heart, it's not a problem. Like, all these are just illusions. Like, you are just playing a role in a game, like in a movie. So in a movie, we see uh, so much drama, like, all these problems, blah, blah, blah. But we as audience, we actually don't think it's a problem. It's just the problems of those characters in the movies, which are not real. It's a bit like the situation here in the world of Sansara. It's not real. So you should not identify them as problems. When you don't identify them as problems, they're not problems. And there's no obstacles. You can move freely in the world. And this good man will go a bit over time. So this good man will easily be reborn as a human and will perfect all the Samadabhadra's merit and virtue. Not long after, he will be like Bodhisattva Samadabhadra and quickly accomplish a subtle and wonderful physical body complete with the 32 marks of a great man. If he is born among humans or heavenly beings, he will always live in a superior family. He can destroy all evil paths and stay away from all evil friends. He can subdue all external paths and liberate from all afflictions. Like a lion king defeats all beasts, he is worthy of receiving offerings from all living beings. So this is talking about for someone who like reads and you know practices this, upholds this, you can also easily be reborn as a human. Uh, this is if uh, if you're not going to the pure land, then you can also be reborn as a human or from your past life. Like if you practice this, then you can be reborn as a human. And not only that, you can uh, be born in a superior family like with really good marriage, good fortune, and also good look, like wonderful physical body and all this. So he can destroy all evil paths and stay away from all evil friends. Right? Because uh, if you think alike, then you are alike. The close friends mostly like, think alike like you. Right. Like why they, he, this person can stay away from all evil friends because he doesn't think any evil. So he doesn't attract this kind of friends. And he can subdue all external paths, uh, external teachings. Uh, all the teachings that are not a Buddha Dharma, we call the external teachings. That teachings that tell you to seek outside of yourself are called external teachings instead of telling you to realize from within. Okay, so liberate from all afflictions, like lion can defeat all beasts, he's worthy of receiving offerings from all living beings. And it's not saying that he can definitely receive offerings from all living beings, but it's saying he is worthy of receiving offerings from all living beings. So further, when this person is on the verge of death, right, this is actually the most important part I really want to talk about tonight. Further, when this person is on the verge of death, in the last moment, when all the roots are scattered and damaged, when all relatives are forsaken, all power is withdrawn, his ministers and great officials, palaces and cities, elephants, horses and carriages, and treasures of precious jewels, all of this can no longer accompany him. Only this king's of vows will not be away from him. Okay, again, this really reminds us about impermanence, which all of us, have to face at one point in this life, right? When this person is on the verge of death in the last moment, when all the roots are scattered and damaged. So roots in Buddhism, we'll talk about the eyes, the ears, right? the six roots, the six faculties, right? All this are scattered and damaged, like this physical body is gone. You say bye-bye to it. When all relatives are forsaken, uh, you will not have any friends and relatives that can actually you know, go with you, all power is withdrawn. So whether you are like the most rich and famous influential person, it doesn't matter. I, in, impermanence, when impermanence happens, he doesn't care. Impermanence doesn't know, oh, you are like the rich and famous, therefore you should not die. It's not like that. So his ministers and great officials, and even if you're a king, so what? I, at this time, you will not be able to bring anything with you ministers, great officials, palaces, cities, elephants, horses, treasures, 
no longer accompany him. But what will not be away would be the king's vows. Uh, if you are actually practicing it, uh, you remember it. At all times, they will guide him forward. In one instant, he will be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss. Uh, see where Bodhisattva Samadabhadra wants us to go to the pure land. Upon arrival, he will immediately see Amitabha Buddha, Bodhisattva Manjushri, Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva Maitriya, and others. The appearances of these Bodhisattvas are dignified and adorned, and complete with all merit and virtue. Together, they will surround him. Okay, this is really, really important message for us Pure Land practitioners, and why this is a Pure Land Sutra. Why the 10 great vows, the practices and vows of Bodhisattvas and Madhubhadra is actually relevant to Pure Land practitioners because the Pure Land Dharma gate is not only for like, you know, some people think, oh, just less intelligent people, like, you know, silly people who can't realize enlightenment, you know, grandmas, grandpas, they kneel for, they go to the Pure Land. It's also for highly enlightened beings like Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, like Bodhisattva Manjushri, like Sudana, like Guan Yin, even Guan Yin is in the Pure Land. Right? If you look down at the Pure Land Dharma again, you are not just looking down at us ordinary unenlightened beings. You are looking down at Amitabha Buddha. You are looking down at Bodhisattva Manjushri, Samadabhadra, Avalokiteshvara, and Maitreya. And then we're like, isn't Hanon, isn't Maitreya in the two-seater heaven exposing the Dharma and waiting to be coming down to realize the Buddha, you know, after billions of years? Yes, Maitreya is also in the two-seater heaven, the inner court of the two-seater heaven to be in the future Buddha in the Saha world after Shakyamuni Buddha. But he is also in the pure land. And look at who else in the Pure Land. Manjushri is in the Pure Land. Some of the Bhadra is in the Pure Land. And others, all the Bodhisattvas, the Buddhas that you have heard so far, you can see all of them in the Pure Land. Amitabha Buddha is not alone in the Pure Land, okay? <laughs> so this is what's uh, so uh, beautiful when you study Chinese Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, you really see the whole Pure Land picture. Uh, I see some school, maybe they only talk about Amitabha Buddha and nothing else. Like as if Amitabha Buddha is like a stand alone, like a loner in the pure land. It's not. Like he's not. He's accompanied with infinite Buddha bodhisattvas. And you will also see Shakyamuni Buddha in the pure land if you go to the pure land. And you can also see Medicine Buddha in the pure land if you go to the pure land. Uh, whichever Buddhas and bodhisattvas you want to see or Siddhagaba, you can all see when you are in Amitabha Buddha's pure land. Like it's the Dharma realm. And also all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they have incarnation in the Pure Land, in the Saha world, in all the worlds in the 10 directions, inconceivable state of liberation of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Okay, and all these Bodhisattvas and Buddhas will surround this person. Uh, this is really talking about the highest grade of rebirth, uh, we, which we're gonna study also the ninth grade of rebirth. I, if we study the text in the Visualization Sutra, one of the uh, three primary Pure Land Sutra, then you will see uh, what kind of a fruit it will get for beings who obtain high grade of rebirth. And this is talking about really highest level of the high grade for those who not only generate bodhicitta. Uh, if you can generate bodhicitta, you are on a high grade of rebirth. If not only you can generate bodhicitta, you have good cultivation and you even practice this 10 great vows, you are definitely like not only guaranteed rebirth, you will be on the highest level of the highest grade. And this is actually available to all, all of us, all the ordinary unenlightened beings as well, not only to like highly enlightened beings, all the nine grades of rebirth are actually for ordinary unenlightened beings like us. It's just whether we are willing to put in a bit more effort uh, before we go to the pure land. Now, when we have the time, you will not regret to cultivate diligently and to follow these 10 great vows. When you kneel for, you know how to direct your mind. Really think about 
all beings, uh, the essence of all beings is like Amitabha Buddha, is like infinite light and life. Uh, this is how you can activate your own Buddha nature as well. Like I highlight all of this because all of this are actually important. Right? So this person will see himself being born from a lotus and will receive a prediction from the Buddha. After receiving the prediction, he will pass through countless hundreds of thousands of coaches from the Yotas of Karpas and throughout ineffably ineffable worlds of the 10 directions. With the power of wisdom, he will accord with the minds of living beings in order to benefit them. Uh, that's why Bodhisattva need to accord with living beings. Uh, if you don't accord with living beings, if you're like constantly against living beings, you cannot benefit them. Uh, they don't like you. They, they will not want to listen to what you're saying. So this person, upon going to the Pure Land, will see all these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. He will see himself being born from the lotus and will immediately receive a prediction from the Buddha. After receiving this prediction, he has the ability to pass through a prediction of what prediction to realize Buddhahood. So for someone who will realize Buddhahood, when you see the Buddha, the Buddha will give you a prediction and say, okay, someone, someone, like maybe uh, Jadi, you will realize Buddhahood after you know certain time and then your pure land will be called this, this, and then you can save how many sentient beings, blah, blah, blah. Like all this day, the Buddha can see clearly. And that's what's a called prediction. Court. And then he will pass through countless hundreds of thousands of coaches of Neotas to Karpas at infinite life times and throughout ineffably ineffable worlds of the 10 directions with the power of wisdom. For someone who realized Buddhahood definitely uh, have the power of wisdom uh, and to accord with the minds of living beings with all skillful means to benefit them. Not long after, he will sit in a Bodhimanda, subdue the demonic armies, accomplish the equal and proper enlightenment. Right, this is full Buddhahood. Not long after, this person will really very fast realize full Buddhahood and turn the wonderful Dharma wheel. He will enable living beings in worlds as many as five modes of dust like the Buddha lands to generate Bodhicitta. Not only he can turn the wonderful Dharma wheel, and why to turn the wonderful Dharma wheel? It's also to awaken beings to help them to generate bodhicitta. He will teach and bring them into maturity in accordance with their roots. Uh, different people have different roots, different uh, capacities, preferences, uh, levels of intelligence. So the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will speak in accordance to their capacities. Even to the end of the seeds of the future kappas, he will greatly benefit all living beings. Good man, if all sentient beings hear and believe in this great vows, and if they uphold, read, and recite them, and speak widely for people, then all the merit obtained from this. There's no one except the Buddhas, the world only ones know it. So for someone who hear and believe and uphold, and read, and recite, and not only that, speak widely for people, then the merit you generated from this no one can know but the Buddhas. Why? Like, because this is really at the level of the Buddha. Only the Buddha. This vows help one to realize Buddhahood. So only a Buddha knows like, what the Buddha is like. So like, in, inconceivable, incredible. Therefore, you who hear these kinds of vows should have no doubt and reverently accept them. Upon accepting, you should be able to read them Upon reading, you should be able to recite them. And upon reciting, you should be able to uphold them, even writing them out and extensively explaining them to others. Okay, so this is what Bodhisattva Samadabhadra wants us to do, uh, to accept them without doubt, to read them. If you can, best to recite them. And maybe you don't need to recite like, the whole of it. If you can just remember the 10 great vows, that's great. Right? I'm currently reciting like the whole of the sutra because I want to really also extensively explain them to others. I want to have good merit, so I need to do this. So and then in a single thought, such people's practices and vows will be accomplished. The blessings one will obtain, one will attain are measureless and balanced. One will be able to rescue living beings from a vast sea of afflictions and suffering, enabling them to exit the cycle of samsara, so they can all be reborn in Amitabha Buddha's land of 
ultimate bliss. Uh, isn't it incredible? Uh, towards the end, all these 10 great vows are to direct us to realize Buddhahood and also to direct us to seek rebirth to the pure land. Uh, how to realize Buddhahood? Well, the Sama Samadabhadra tells us clearly, go to the pure land, like practice these vows, and of course, near for and go to the pure land. Uh, and you can also be born in a high grade of rebirth. So that concludes the session on the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. So it concludes the 10 great vows. So if you go and see the sutra actually after this, by Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, uh, speak all, all of this again in verses. Uh, so I'm gonna translate a full version of the sutra. And then I'll put it on our uh, Google Drive, our Pure Land Drive, uh, for anyone who is interested in uh, reading uh, in your spare time to read, to study them, uh, you can, and just to download freely. Currently, you can also uh, Google and uh, download uh, the sutra like this uh, from Google, uh, but I'll also do another translation. Uh, hopefully it will be easier to understand. So we'll do the merit transfer. We transfer the merit to all beings in the entire Dharma realm. Right? May the resulting merit and virtue be distributed everywhere without discrimination. May we all generate the answer past bodhicitta and be born in the land of ultimate bliss. Namo Amitabha Buddha, Namo Ami to fall.